my pet. Okay. So actually, we have uh, uh, covered quite a lot uh, so far, and uh, I hope we can sort of uh, finish our our review of uh, thermodynamics this week, and then we will uh, starting to actually uh, have. Um, discuss about uh, statistical mechanics. That's the uh, real two subject of this course. Okay. And some of you um, email me um, to ask about whether we will have uh, recordings of this, uh, of my lectures and uh, uh, actually we, we, we do. And uh, I will, I, I need to do a little bit edit. So I will probably upload uh, in sometime this week to NTU Cool, as well as uh, uh, some sort of uh, um, uh, YouTube channel. Okay, so I will announce, I will email over you about this. Uh, another thing is the homework number one is due today. Okay, the due date is this afternoon, uh, no, tonight, <laughs> this evening. So. Uh, please submit your homework, upload your homework. Oh, you can either copy uh, photo, take photos or scan whatever, uh, provide your homework and upload your phone homework to NTU Cool. Some of you might not have registered for this course yet. It's probably uh, still in process. So uh, in that case, you can, e you can email me, but I, I, I ask uh, you, any, any, any of you who already registered to this course, please upload the homework in the NTU Cool platform because in that way it's easier for me to, uh, to, to see who have already uploaded, who have not. Okay, so, and we have uh, homework number one, I already posted it on NTU Cool. So please download homework number one. It's number two, number two. And uh, it's still, um, I think 14th, yeah, around 10 days from now. It's about the uh, thermal dynamics we, that we have covered, uh, will be covered today and uh, in the past week. Okay, so any questions so far? Yeah, uh, Professor, I have a question about please. upload by homework five and i put yes. my question in uh, our catalog can you see it uh let me check it out sorry about that uh, i just came back from came back from a meeting so it's not very well set up yet to find my so what is your question you cannot upload or what uh yeah. Uh, my problem is even I have a guest account in NTU. Oh, guest account cannot upload to uh, upload the homework. You don't have this homework or assignment functionality. But if you have registered to this course, you should have had an account. So this means my, uh, you, you need to check if you are using your uh, official account to log in. I mean, because uh, we uh, initially initially we don't have uh, the information about students who are in the uh, TG, uh, uh, TIGP program who enrolled in this course. We don't have the information. So uh, I uh, personally add a few of you using your email to the NTU Cool platform. But if you look carefully, you might find another NTU Cool account or some something that 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 the, you know the the school the, the the your TIGP program actually opened for you. And if you switch to that account, you might be able to upload. That's one thing. Okay, I, because I have no control over the uh, user or or or, 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 or I cannot add official uh, registered user on NTU Cool. So you have uh, to ask uh, 
the may, maybe ask and do cool how 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 come you are not enlisted as a a, a registered uh, student yeah so uh, I can only add audit or observer account on until cool if you think you already you should have already registered uh, you should have an official account then please ask your um, department or your uh, or the NTU cool service okay any other questions i saw a question uh i would take a look at this i saw another question on the the class log, but uh, I haven't have time to read it. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a look and then answer this later. Okay. Okay, if not, we should actually continue our uh, discussions. So last week we already covered legenda transformation. Okay. And please, when you learn things like this, you actually, uh, it's good to, see or to actually uh, make connections and to see why, to ask why we need to do this, why? And we know that, so from last, last week, last week, we know that we can write down any change in energy, internal energy, thermodynamic internal energy can be accounted for by calculating TDS, minus P D V plus mu D N. Okay, so this is a, a fundamental equation for thermodynamics. And this tells us that this energy, internal energy actually is a nature function or of uh, entropy, value, and uh, number of particles. Okay, so this is a mathematical statement. S V N is a uh, nature uh, natural variables of energy, which means when you have, when you can experimentally, so this has everything to do with experiments because it's all about when we do an experiment, when we carry out a process, can we account for the change in various thermodynamic variables? So when you can account for, you can measure experimentally change in entropy, volume, and the number of particles, then you can very easily follow, you can very easily calculate the change in energy. That's the, the, the idea about this nature variable. Okay. It does not mean that uh, you have to use this SVN as the variable. It means it's more convenient. It's more convenient because when you know DS, DV, DN, you know DE. That's the key. But if you look at this, this requires that we know S, we know change in entropy, but change in entropy uh, only in one scenario, it, it will be easy to determine. Do you know, do, do you know when, when the change in entropy will be easy to determine? Think about it, when? In what case, in what case, in, in what kind of process the change of entropy is very clear? Adiabatic. Adiabatic, not only adiabatic, end. Reversible. That's right, that's right. Okay, good. Yeah. Change in entropy is only appear apparent when you have a reversible. Reversible is required because you need a reversible process to calculate entropy. Reversible and adiabatic. Adiabatic means there's no heat exchange. So, in reversible adiabatic process, there's no change in entropy. DS equals to zero in that case. Otherwise, normally entropy change is very difficult to follow. Okay, you don't have an entropy meter that allows you to measure entropy at any time. So this S is not a very convenient variable experimentally. More generally speaking, in our everyday life, we can carry out experiments under normal uh, constant temperature. Constant volume is fine, but constant volume, constant number of particles, or constant temperature, constant pressure, right? 
So we want to change a variable, and the way we do it is through this agenda transform the way we uh, mentioned last week. And I, uh, now I will directly apply it. So here we realize that S and T are conjugate variables. V and P are conjugate variables. N and the mu, the chemical potential, are conjugate variables. And uh, you can switch conjugate variables through legendary transformation. So if you want to say, want to find, if we want, if we want to find a thermodynamic function that will be most convenient used in constant uh, in temperature, volume and n number of particles are well controlled. So they are as nature variables. And we know that it can be derived from energy because S and E T can be exchanged, can be switched. How to do that? We we'll define another function, which is E minus this conjugate variable pair S T. And if you take the total, total, total derivative, this will be DE minus DTDS minus SDT. If we plug in DE here, then you can very easily see that it ends up with minus SDT and minus PDV plus mu DN. So we now know that this A, Helmholtz free energy, is actually a function of uh, T, temperature, temperature, volume, and N. So this is called Helmholtz. Free energy. This, fr this free energy functions are actually auxiliary functions that are very useful when we deal with experiments in different conditions. So in this case, if you, in your experiment, you control change in temperature, change in volume, change in number of particles, then this Helmholtz free energy will be the function that you should use to describe the thermodynamic properties in your experiment. In another scenario, one might be interested in doing this experiment at constant temperature and pressure and the number of particles. This is what chemists do all the time when you are in the lab using a beaker and they use stir, you do a chemical reaction over there. Normally it's in a constant pressure, it's open to the uh, atmosphere, so it's constant pressure set up. In that case, in that case, TPN will be a better uh, way to describe your experiment. Okay, in that case we define G. So in order to now change temperature, here is, uh, sorry, volume, volume to pressure, we define G as A minus PV, but because it's minus PV, so we have plus PV. So the conjugate pair is minus PV. So we minus minus PV, we have plus PV. To check it, you we plug in dA my plus PdV plus VdP, and dA is here, here, is here. Yeah. So see that minus PdV and the plus T, PdV will cancel out. Yeah. So you we end up with dA equals two minus SdT plus V D P plus mu D N. Okay. And of course, of course, this is a familiar Gibbs free energy. Another thermodynamic function very commonly used is in the natural variable of entropy. Okay. S and P and N. So this can be derived from a Legendre transformation of energy by switching this PV pair. So it's, this is called H, H. So it's uh, energy 
plus P V. So D H equals to D E plus P D V plus V D P. So it will be T D S plus V D P plus mu D N. Okay. And this is enthalpy. And this, this thermodynamic functions have their own use in uh, various conditions, and most importantly, or most critically defined by these experimental conditions. It has to do with, in your experiments, what are the norms, what are the changes you made in your experiment. Now, we will take a look a little bit more at the Helmholtz free energy. But actually, the similar thing can be applied to uh, not just Helmholtz free energy, but other free energy functions, other free energy functions. So we want to, of course, you should have uh, already familiar with this free energy functions. We want to kind of examine changes in A in a process. Well, we can ask, we can ask changes in also G. Yeah, but now we will use A to illustrate this idea, this idea. Okay. And specifically, we want to say, talk about this at constant. T, V, N. But at constant temperature and the volume and the N, A is actually well defined for equilibrium states. For equilibrium. But however, if we have a scenario where the change is from state one to state two, but this state one could be non-equilibrium. In that case, even at constant TVN, this a this free energy, uh, Helmholtz free energy will be different. Will be different. So we can calculate delta A change of uh, Helmholtz free energy in this process from one to two, from one to two. And of course, it will be free energy of uh, state two minus free energy of state one. State one could be a uh, non-equilibrium state. Okay. So this will be E two minus T two as two minus E1 minus T1 is one. So if you collect turns and I realize that now we assume this temperature is constant. So they are the same temperature. During the process, there's no temperature change. There's no temperature. So this became delta E. E2 must be E1 and uh, minus T delta S. Delta S. Delta S. And TDRS, of course, could be this everything here could be written. I don't need to actually write that. And we know that from the first law, the change in energy should be measured either in heat or in work. So this delta E is delta is Q plus W minus T delta S. So if we have uh, now also have a constant V and N. Constant volume, there's no PV work. Constant N, there's no chemical work. So your total work equals to zero. We, if we further assume, we consider a diabetic process, then Q equals to zero. What this means is your delta A, your change in Helmholtz free energy now became minus T delta S for adiabatic. Constant TVN processes. Because it's for, it's for adiabatic, so we let's put it 
adiabatic here, okay? Now you, re you realize that in this constant TVM process, in this adiabatic constant TVM process, the change in Helmholtz free energy actually is a direct measure of the change in your entropy. So your delta S adiabatic must be greater or equal to zero. Equal sign means it's reversible case. If it's greater than zero, then it's a, 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 a spontaneous process, irreversible process. So this second law actually is equilibrium. It's equivalent, sorry, is equivalent to saying that your delta A, recognize there's a minus sign here, so your delta A now must be smaller or greater than zero for of the abiotic process at constant TVM. So at constant temperature, constant volume, constant number of particles, if a process is uh, spontaneous, then its Helmholtz free energy change must be decreasing, must be negative, must be negative. So we have a maximum en entropy principle then became minimum free energy principle. In the equilibrium state, your entropy reaches its maximum at that condition, at that uh, uh, constant Tm, Vm, N. But this translates to minimizing the free energy, free energy. So at constant TVN, we look at delta A smaller than zero. And it will be actually kind of trivial to follow that at constant T, P, N. Now, they are natural variable of uh, the Gibbs free energy. So in this case, the equilibrium condition became Gibbs free energy must be smaller or equal to than zero. Okay. So a spontaneous process must decrease in the Gibbs free energy at constant temperature, pressure, and the number of particles, constant Tp. So all the second law, all now uh, instead of using entropy to uh, kind of uh, evaluate second law and to evaluate the, the, the rationality of a reaction of a process, now we can use free energy, suitable free energy at a given condition. Okay, given condition means whether you are TVN constant or TPN constant. And this became a mi mi minimum free energy principle. So, okay. And this delta GY is particularly relevant for chemists because many of our chemical reactions actually are controlled to happen in a constant temperature and pressure uh, scenario. We can further discuss this um, meaning of uh, the gives uh, Helmholtz free energy, but I won't, why well, don't want to go into a detail. The thing is one can also prove, I give this as an exercise for you. You can go back and try to prove this. It's not so difficult actually. And maybe many of you already done it in your undergraduate thermodynamic course. So one can prove that this inequality mass work must be smaller or equal to minus delta A. I keep the equality 
sign equal sign here because work W is defined as the work done on the system. So it's minus sign minus M minus W means the work work done by the system. So the work done by the system to the outside world. So if you are asking an engine, this will be the output of the engine, right? So done by the system, actually this means output from the system, okay? Output from the system. Must be smaller or equal. Equal sign happens at reverse ball. Again, reverse ball. S I D L E, then you have this equal sign. To the amount of free energy, Helmholtz free energy decreased. Minus sign here. Minus sign. So this is amount of Helmholtz. G L M. Free energy. Decreased. This is why it's called free energy. It's energy free to do work, to do work. So minus delta A is the maximum amount of work the system can output. It's a state function. So if you change a system from state one to state two, then you can determine, you know, the maximum amount of work that this system can output, can, can do work, can be used to perform work by the system. And this is the upper limit. This is the upper limit. You cannot go beyond this. You know, cannot go beyond this. And you can be small, uh, lower than this. In that case, actually, not all the free energy is being converted into work. Some of it must be dis dissipated as heat and get lost. Okay, so this is the maximum, the maximum. So decrease of free energy can be put into use and in, put into work, but there's a limit there. You cannot, you cannot go beyond, you cannot perform work more than this. So in the process and reverse ball process actually allows the system to output the most work to convert all the only in a reverse ball process that the system can convert all the free energy into work. Write it down. Only in the reverse ball. Process. The system can convert all minus delta A into work. I'll keep it minus sign over there to emphasize that this is a work done from the system, done by the system, not, not on the system. Okay. Is that okay? So we have covered the basic equation uh equations, uh including for this uh auxiliary free energy functions. They are very useful and uh, a lot of thermodynamic properties or thermodynamic relationships can be derived from those uh, equations. So we will go through not all, all of them. I, there's no way that I, that I can go over all the thermodynamic equations. There are too many of them. But I will try to uh, go through a few and give you give you a kind of a, a feeling, how a test of uh, how can we derive those equations and how those equations could be applied. So the first uh, the first one is a very important one that I want to talk about. This is called a Gibbs Helmholtz equation. This Gibbs 
Helmholtz equation is very important for connecting, uh, for determining the uh, temperature dependence of Gibbs free energy. And of course, it's a very useful uh, relationship. The idea is to start from this uh, change in Gibbs free energy. So dg equals to minus s dt plus v dp plus mu dn. We start from here. Okay. One thing we recognize in intermediate is if we compare this to the total derivative of a g as a function of a t and the p and n we know that actually those thermodynamic functions in front of it are all first order different uh, first order derivatives of g d okay what do i mean i mean because G is a function of a T, P, N, we can then directly write down its total derivative. Its total derivative it will be partial G, partial T, at constant P and N in T, plus partial G, partial P. So we talk about this conjugate variable uh, relationships already. So it's T and N, P, Plus partial g partial n constant t and p dn, and so we know that actually s equals to minus s equals to partial g partial t, volume equals to partial g partial p, mu the chemical potential equals to partial g partial n. Okay, I'm not going to write down all of that. I'm going to write down only one of them. So. S minus equals minus partial G partial T P N T P N. Okay. Now we also know that we also know, or we also very often want to determine not uh not just a single point g but we want to determine uh in the process uh, what's the delta g what's the delta g so let's say we if we have the system in some initial state to final state initial to final g is a state function so we can write down the initial state g will be enthalpy so i already forgot to uh, actually, this is quite easy to determine. We define G here, right? G here. So if we plug in A, A is E minus ST plus PV. And E plus PV is this. It's H. So this will be H minus ST. Okay? So we know that G will be H minus S T I. This is initial, initial. And the final state will be this. And what we are interested in here is we want to do this. Um, process at constant temperature. Constant temperature, constant temperature. So in this, the temperature is a constant and uh, in your state, final state, they have the same temperature. So this T, there's no need to have this subscript, the T, it's T. So your delta G, that's what we often measured or, or what we often are interested in will be delta H minus T delta S. Okay. But this delta T delta S will be will be just Final steps minus 
Inicio stairs. Final minus. Inicio. And this final stairs will be calculated from its free energy. This one also. This one also. So this allows us to rewrite this equation into delta H plus, because this minus sign here, plus T partial delta G partial T. But now your initial state pressure, final state pressure, initial state number of particles, final state number of particles should be constant. And there's a delta G on the left hand side. There's another delta G on the right hand side. So we use a, we normally will want to collect, collect these terms together. So this can be rewrite as delta H equals to minus T squared. Partial, now partial delta G over T. Partial T. You have P I P F N I N F. Oops. So exercise. Tr try to prove this. Actually, to show this equation and the, the previous equation here are the same. You can actually take the derivative here, this chain rule. It's very easy. To confirm this result already. So this is so-called Gibbs Hemholtz equation. Gibbs. This is the Gibbs Hemholtz equation. This equation is actually very useful because it tells us, it allows us to follow the change in Gibbs free energy as a function of the change when temperature changes. So this gives us temperature dependence. Delta G over T and of course this gives delta G, temperature dependence of delta G. So how Gibbs free energy is changed as a function of temperature, of course this is very important thing and very useful, very useful. And even more so is that in thermal dynamics, usually the enthalpy change only weekly depends on temperature. So if delta H is only weekly depends on temperature, and this equation allows allows us then to directly integrate the result and uh, reach a very simple relationship between delta G and temperature. And it's easier to go back here to see this. So if this is temperature independent, maybe this is temperature independent. And now we have a delta G, delta T. So we can try to integrate on both sides and then reach a simple equation between delta G as, as a function of temperature. I'm not going to go there, just rewrite the equation, but this differential form is fine also. So this gives Hamilton's equation allow us to determine the change the uh the delta g as a function of temperature and delta g are related to some dynamic equilibrium constants if you recall okay so it can be measured and uh, it can be used to infer the composition of uh, chemical systems in some uh in some dynamic equilibrium we will go back to this issue after we uh, after we uh, through our discussion on simple or uh, principles of statistical mechanics and uh, go back to this issue with uh, uh, more uh, 
deeper physical perspective by using uh, state map. Okay. Another very useful relationship is called is so called Maxwell relationships. Relations. Maxwell relations. It's a simple fundamental uh, principle of uh, thermodynamics. Oh no, of um, mathematics. Mathematics. Okay. Because if you, a function f is a function of s and y, then we know that partial f, partial s, partial y should equal to partial f partial y partial s the second derivative second derivative should not depend on the you 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 do s derivative first or do y derivative first also another mathematical result that are useful is if we have a f is a function of x or y and also in some cases you can rewrite s f as a function of s and z this means y and z conjugate pairs so y and z are a conjugated pair in, in this case because they come from the same energy term in thermodynamics they come from the same energy term they are conjugate variables they come from the same energy term and they are not in they are not independent they depend on each other so you use either one of them as a your variable if that is this is the case then we can actually change this variable by this relationship this e equality this e e equality if you partial s partial y constant z partial y partial z constant s partial z partial s constant y this is this one this is a uh, equality mathematical equality that i'm not going to prove but it's not too difficult to do this actually in your uh maybe undergraduate calculus or, or some of them is you already do this now let's go back here here this equation so we mentioned that we have de de is t ds minus p d v so i'll do this easy version so i will neglect the change in chemical potential but if we have that change in chemical potential the result will be similar or it actually expands you have more equations you have more relations and we know that is T, in this case, T is partial E partial S as constant V, with only one volume to change. And this P, P is partial E partial V, the constant S. So if we now, Take the derivative of t respect with respect to v, so we partial t, so partial t partial v, partial t partial v at constant, at constant, partial t partial v at constant entropy. And this actually is partial E partial S constant V, then we partial partial V constant S as this. So we do derivative on S first, then V, then V. And you have partial minus P minus P partial. Now this term with respect to this partial s 
Pastor. Oui. And minus P, of course, will be minus outside. So I will pull this outside. I'll show P. And this should be equals to partial E. Now we partial partial V first. And then partial S. And from what we said, they, they should be the same. So this tells us that partial T partial V should equals to partial P partial S. This is one of the Maxwell relations. And there are many more, there are many more. For each equation like this, you can derive one. So you have at least four Maxwell relations. If you account for other forms of energy, you have more Maxwell relations. And why are they useful? They are very powerful results. They are very powerful results. That is because this Maxwell relation connect different thermodynamic properties. Some of them are very difficult to measure experimentally. So in this example, on the right hand side, uh, I want to rewrite this a little bit uh, different, but the, the same equation. Just write this different. I want to write the because it's equality, so I can actually write this as minus partial P, S partial S partial S partial S partial P equals to partial V, partial T. The same equation, right? The same equation. But what does this equation mean? This means the derivative of entropy with respect to pressure. So the pressure dependence of entropy, how entropy change as a function of pressure at constant volume, which is something very difficult to measure experimentally. So this is difficult to measure experimentally. But this equation tells us tells you that you don't have to measure it. You can measure a different function, a different value while getting the same result. Of course, there's a minus sign here, but that's trivial to add, right? But it's the measure that will give us partial S partial P. If we measure volume as a function of a temperature at constant S, a constant S, we know how to do that. We do it in a diabetic, reversible process, then this is okay, right? So this is easy to measure experimentally. How easy you change temperature. You take a look at the, the change in volume at a diabetic condition in a debit condition. It's easy. And actually this is the thermal compressibility coefficient. Right? You change normally a uh, very com very often a uh, uh, solid liquid will expand thermal expansion. It will expand when you increase the temperature. Right? So it's a thermal compressibility. So this Maxwell relationship allows us to relate some dynamic properties that are difficult to measure experimentally to some dynamic properties that are easy to measure experimentally. And it's very powerful because we can do experiment, measure volume and measure temperature, but in the end, you know the change of entropy as a function of pressure. It's very powerful. It's very powerful and very useful. Very useful. And like I said, I 
won't be able to go over all the rationalizations, but uh, go take a look at the Chandler's textbook or any textbook for this matter. You can actually, you can find all of them. And uh, uh, some of them are uh, more useful than the others. Another one is from the Kips framework. We know this change in, yeah, change in, Entropy as a function of volume actually depends on change of pressure as a function of temperature. Okay. And this allows us now to prove many useful thermodynamic equalities between thermodynamic uh, functions. So uh, I think we should take a break here and uh, uh, come back in five minutes, okay? Now, according to my computer, it's 2.13. Let's come back uh, around 2.18, 2.18. Okay, then we will continue our discussion on this, uh, using thermodynamic qualities to connect different thermodynamic uh, properties. So five, five minutes, five minutes. Okay. Uh, so I I see there are some questions asked by I think Tai Hongsen. Are you here? You want to say your question? Uh, uh yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Yes. Um. Okay. Yeah, so uh, according to my to my knowledge in uh, thermodynamics, uh, state variables are used to um, characterize equilibrium states. But I'm wondering why uh, during the derivation of uh, the minimum free energy principle, uh, we start from a non-equilibrium states, but uh, the state variables E1, T1, and S1 are used to characterize the non-equilibrium state. And I'm wondering why uh, uh, is this possible? Yes. Yeah, of course it's possible. This means that in the non-equilibrium state, there are additional, additional variables that defines the system. A very conceptually easy to recognize process system is this. If we have a two volume connected by a tube with some knob, okay? And we say, this is a total system. Okay. V equals two, this is one, V1 plus V2. You, we put gas, we can put gas in one or two, okay? And then of course, temperature can be fixed. They connect to the same reservoir, so the temperature are the same, okay? Total number of particle will be particle in volume one and particle in volume two. But VTM fixed. But we know that there is only single equilibrium state. That equilibrium state will be N1. Assume, okay. Assume. N1 equals, uh, V1 equals to V2. Volume one equals to volume two. So if N1 equals to N2, this will be the equilibrium state. Right? But how about if N1 does not equal to N2? Okay. So if, what if? N1 equals to N, N2 equals to zero. Why is that? Because all the particles are in Subsystem one. In that case, it's non equilibrium. Right? 
right? So this is what I meant. This is what I meant. And actually, David Chandler called this some internal constraint. So if we have a, a system, initial equilibrium system, actually you can apply some internal constraint. You can apply additional condition to shift, to move the system into non-equilibrium states. But you know that after you remove the internal constraint, the system will relax back into the same equilibrium. Okay. David Chandler used this extensively to argue uh, this stability of a system, the, 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 the definition or the, the uniqueness of the equilibrium state, so on and so forth. But this is a case where I would say what the directionality, so what will be the direction goal? It means your delta A must be smaller than zero. Okay. Any question? Yes. yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay. So we will continue. Or, or, or sort of uh, hand wave in the, okay. Say that. Uh, details of this can be found in David Chandler's book, so I'm not going to go into the detail. I'm going to only show you the result. Okay, so the fundamental equations of a thermodynamics definition of various thermodynamic properties, and then Maxwell relations, will allows us to make connections between many useful thermodynamic properties. For example, this very famous or, or very, uh, very important equation, difference between heat capacity at constant pressure and uh, heat capacity at constant value can be written in this equality equation. This is an equation, equality, partial P, partial V, constant T and N. Partial V so T T N squared. This is a thermodynamic equality that can be proved by using Maxwell relationships and uh, the fundamental equation of thermodynamics and some fundamental uh, calculus. Okay, I'm not going to show you the proof. It's in David Chandler's book, but you should go through this. Okay, it's a good practice to go through this. I want to emphasize here is how remarkable this is. This proof, this equality actually connects heat capacity. Which experimentally, when you measure heat capacity, what do you do? You allow a body to absorb certain number of heat. Okay, you will control uh, current and uh, the time, the, uh, the conductance of the system. We can we know how much heat will be generated uh, per unit of time, and then we can actually know exactly how much heat we put into a system if we use this heater to heat up the system. And then you measure temperature change. The temperature change, of course, you use a thermometer, then so it's easy to measure. And you can calculate heat capacity, heat capacity, right? And doing this experiment either in constant pressure condition or constant volume condition, we have this difference in heat capacity. So it's a sort of a measurement of a heat. But then this change, this difference in heat capacity can be related to partial P, partial V. What is this? If you apply pressure, increase the pressure, the volume of the system will decrease. This always, it has to decrease when pressure increases. Okay. And this has to do with the compressibility of uh, the system at constant temperature. So this is uh, inverse. Because compressibility will be partial V, partial P, and this is just inverse of partial V, partial P. So this is the inverse isothermal compressibility. 
B I L I T thermal compressibility. And this is the coefficient of a thermal expansion we actually dis, uh, just discussed called coefficient of thermal expansion. There are some sort of a thermal mechanical properties of the system, okay, with respect to volume change and how volume change as function of pressure. Pressure, you apply force and look at how volume change. They are mechanical, mechanical properties. So this, those mechanical properties are actually related to the thermal properties, this heat capacity difference. It's very remarkable, it's because Normally, we wouldn't expect those experiments are connected to each other. But through thermodynamics, we can derive equalities that connect those important properties. And now you can actually do a mechanical measurement to get a thermal property. How remarkable this is. And in thermodynamics, the essence is they all the change, the change in volume, change in volume has to do with PV work. So it's some change in energy. So this energy flow from one form of energy to another form of energy in material systems, they must be connected. They are interconnected. So think about it, think about it. This equation is very remarkable and it tells us that in thermal dynamics, very often we can determine experimental result of one set of experiments from experimental result of another set of experiments. And a very common, uh, commonly used strategy is we would record, we will tabularize, tabularize some uh, easily measured and useful thermodynamic properties. And then we can use those tabularized thermodynamic properties to, cal to calculate uh, some experimental results that we want to measure. So thermodynamics is a very powerful quantitative science that allows us to predict predict uh, properties of uh, materials from sometimes sim uh, relationships that are that do not look uh, uh, trivial. Like, like I said, in this case, we connect. In this case, we connect mechanical properties with some thermal properties. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, again, okay. I welcome any question. I welcome you to stop me, to interrupt me if you feel it's not clear. Okay. Later on, I will post the video on YouTube as well as on uh, NTU Cool. But you know, don't think about you have always go back to read a video and just just watch it again and again. If you have a questions, we can have a discussion. Very often it's more effective that way. Okay. Okay, if not, we will now cover the last uh, important thermodynamic properties. And it's actually the foundation of thermodynamics. It's very important. And uh, the, you can actually build up all the thermodynamic results based on, based on this, based on this. And it's the extensive, extensiveness, extensiveness. E -S -T -E -N, extensive, S-I-V-E and E-S-S. -E -S. Okay. So we want to formally and mathematically define what do we mean by extensive, extensive. Actually, all the thermodynamic properties can be assigned either as an intensive property or extensive. Okay. And in every conjugate pair, there's one extensive and one intensive properties. So for example, S and T, they are conjugate pair. Temperature is intensive. Well, Entropy is extensive. ST, PV, so pressure, what? Intensive or extensive? Pressure. Pressure. 
pressure is intensive. How about volume? Volume is extensive. Chemical potential and the number of particles. N is extensive. Mu, chemical potential is intensive. It's intensive. And how do we formally or mathematically define this? Let's take energy as an example. Energy is uh, in extensive thermodynamic property. Actually, all the energy functions are extensive thermodynamic functions, extensive functions. The extensiveness of E means if E is a function of uh, entropy and the various uh, work-related variables. Here, I will go back to use X. Remember, X is a vector. In this case, it will be uh, volume, number of particles, and if you have other, other uh, properties, you, you can write it here. But it's an array of uh, extensive. We use extensive version of this. So it's an array of uh, extensive, extensive variables. Extensive variables. And S, of course, is extensive. So the extensiveness means, uh, or if we want to express this mathematically, it means that if we do a measurement on a system, on a system, in which, in which the entropy is multiplied by lambda times. So you have the lambda. S and X is multiplied by lambda times. This will be if we lambda equals to two means you actually have a double the size of the system. So lambda is the ratio that you scale the size of the system. Okay, if you do the measurement of uh, internal energy at a system with different size you will have this. And extensiveness means if you do it in a system that's lambda times bigger than our original system, then this external and uh, internal energy, this energy will be lambda times bigger than the original. Right? So this will be lambda times E S X. Okay. So this is the mathematical definition of extensiveness extensive system must satisfy this equality. And it's actually very easy to understand that this is the case. And this kind of extensive function is called a first order, first order homogeneous, homogeneous function. It's easy to see because there's a first order relationship in this linear scaling function. And this first order homogeneous function of uh, S and X, according to Euler, homogeneous function, function. theorem. They have some unique properties. They have some unique properties. Okay. So let's kind of go back to the formal fundamental relationship of a, a function. So let's say I have f. f is a function of s1, s2, da, 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 s n. And because f lambda s1, lambda s2, lambda s n will be lambda f s1, s2. You have n variables in this case. Okay. So from the right hand side, from the right hand side, now we have a right hand side, we have a, a left hand side. From the right hand side, we have, a, if we take the derivative of a f of f, 
with respect to lambda. Okay. So this is f defined like this. And if we partial f, partial lambda, and with all the x i fixed, so we now change, basically you change, you scale the size of the system. You scale the size of the system. And the derivative, the slope will be f. Okay. We call this equation one. This is from the right hand side. Right hand side. RHS means right hand side. And I can use LHS, that will be left hand side. And we were, we are going to use this right away. So from the left hand side, what do we have? From the left hand side, we have uh, partial F, partial lambda, and XI is fixed. And then we will be sum over on the heaven side, we need to do this derivative one by one, one by one, because you have uh, now so many lambda in there. Okay, so we can take derivative of the first turn, second turn, and so on. So you have we have totally n turns, and we will have a partial f partial lambda s i is. S J you know it goes to S I fixed and then pi's partial lambda S I partial lambda. In this case S I will be fixed. This is uh, just chain rule. Chain rule because F have many many lambda in there. So we have to take the first one with regarding S1. Lambda, so you have a, you take the original lambda s one, then partial lambda s one, partial lambda will give you the result. It's okay. This is just take derivative using chain rule. Okay. And lambda is a constant. So over here. It's clear that we can pull this lambda outside. Uh, we don't need to do it right now. And over here, it's clear that when SI is fixed, partial lambda, SI partial lambda gives us SI. Okay? So this gives an equation that has many, many turns, i equals to one to n, but each turn is a derivative partial f partial lambda s i s j not equals to s i. All the other s are fixed, fixed. And then you time s i. Of course, this equation two, equation two. Equation one and equation two are two sides of the equation. So you take the derivative, they must be the same. Okay. So what we do here is we can equate this two function. So your f of s1, s2, da, 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 sn must equals to sum r equals to one to n, partial f, partial sn, and this is true for all lambda. We can, of course, we can, of course, write down the case for lambda equals to one. And this equality also holds. In this case, your f is written as r equals to one to n partial f partial si. Okay. 
So this means any first order homogeneous function can be written as a summation, a summation over many turns. Whereas in each turn, there is an extensive variable, extensive. And another variable, which is a derivative of this function f, with respect to this extensive variable. Okay, so this is uh, because f is extensive, x i is also extensive. You have uh, this extensive extensiveness depending on the number of particles will cancel out each other. So in the end, this is intensive. So this f, this first order homogeneous function can be written as some mention of many terms. Each term has two parts, one intensive variable and another one is a, it's extensive variable. No, nothing else, there's no constant. There's no constant associated with this. Otherwise, it, the function will not be extensive. And this is intensive variable and extensive variable are connected to each other because this intensive variable has the derivative of f with, with respect to this extensive variable. So they are conjugate variables, you see. Uh, partial f, partial xi. And S I conjugate variables. They are conjugate pairs. Okay. So let's go back to some more dynamics. If this function is energy, energy of course is an extensive function. It's extensive function. So this function is a function of uh, this function divided by S plus this function divided by, I will now expand X, okay? I will use uh, second of the PDV, so value. S and V and N constant. V, you have uh, S and N constant. Okay. Yes. Constant S and V. What is this? We should know each of them. Let's see. This is temperature. This is minus pressure. This is chemical potential. So I'm going to write this down. Your energy function actually is Ts minus Pv plus mu n. The difference between this one and the total derivative one is this one is the absolute function. WP one. And from here, A, A is E minus T S. E minus T S. So A will be, I'll write down this. Minus P V plus mu N. And what's G? G is A plus P V. Right? Minus G. A plus P V. So G is mu plus N. Your chemical potential times N. Okay. Of course, if you have a multiple chemical components, this should have a written as a summation. 
I talk about this when we introduce this notation. So uh, for that matter, we'll put it there. Okay. So let's say this is summation. And I and I. Summation mu I and I. Summation mu I and I. Summation mu I. Many different chemical components, different molecules. Yeah. Each of them contribute to your Gibbs free energy. So this episode form very clearly tells us the nature of those small dynamic functions. And it's also useful to derive new useful equations. For example, from here, from here, we know that the E equals to T D S plus S D T minus P D V minus P D T. Summation I mean I D N I plus summation I and I D I. But we also know that from the fundamental equation of thermodynamics, we already show that energy change, energy is a natural function of S and the V and the N. So energy change will be T D S, T D S minus P D V plus summation i mu i d n i. So if we compare these two equations, and we substitute both sides, we have another equation. We have another equation. So I will say this is one minus two. What we have will be TDS cancel out, minus PDV cancel out. Now this uh, mu I DNA cancels out. We what remains are uh, SDT T minus VDP plus summation I and I D mu I. And it must be zero. Yes. This is called so called the Gibbs Duhan equation. If your system is in an equilibrium state, it must satisfy, it must satisfy this equality, this equation. This equation is particularly useful in examining phase transition rules or phase boundaries. But uh, we would not have time to go uh, into this detail, go into this detail. But a very uh, useful thing to look, look at this is by, so if we rearrange this a little bit, you see that N I D mean I equals to V D P minus S D T. And you realize that If we can measure the change in temperature and change in pressure, of course, change in temperature and change in pressure, they are easy to control and easy to measure, right? Okay. And we can determine the change in chemical potential. So this equation very powerfully links the change in temperature and pressure to change in chemical potential. And change in chemical potential allows us to calculate change in Gibbs free energy. This is its absolute absolute form. So if we can measure the change in chemical potential while fixing the molarity of our particles in the system, then we know then we know the change of chemical potential. So it's very useful in uh, connecting Gibbs free energy with diff, uh, how chemical potential changes as a function of temperature and the pressure. And at constant pressure and the temperature, <laughs> what am I doing, stupid? <laughs> Unbelievable. So 
Furthermore, if we look at this equation at constant temperature and the pressure, constant PT, very normal condition for chemical reactions, right? And in this case, I mentioned I and I D mu I equals to zero. This is the condition for thermal equilibrium at constant pressure and uh, temperature. And it's about chemical potential, so about chemical components. So this is condition for chemical equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium. And it's very useful, very useful for chemistry. It means if we have a certain composition, we know the Ni, all the number of particles, all, all the more, how many more of uh, A, how many more of B, how many more of C, how many more of D, then the equilibrium conditions is this Nid, meanwhile, this change in chemical potential multiplied by this N, this number of particles, and sum them up. It should equal to zero. And actually, this corresponds to no change in delta G. So this equals it is equivalent to saying that your Gibbs free energy is in its minimum, and any change, any change at this this, this equilibrium means this delta G change must be equal to zero. We will go back to this later when we consider statistics of the uh, uh, chemical reactions. chemical reactions. Okay, we already covered the absolute form of this, so we don't need to uh, go any further. And uh, this gives Duhan equation. Okay, so I, I think we should stop here. Okay. Any questions? So up to this point, we have covered basically all the common or, or, or conventional thermodynamics. And I want you to recognize that we do this with a solid foundation of the first defined this uh, entropy function and uh, what's the relationship, uh, what's the, 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 the property of this entropy function. And from there, and we use basic mathematics calculus to derive all the results, okay? And we can even figure out, we have in, in thermal dynamics, we can actually define absolute energy and uh, uh, absolute free energies. And this is actually quite profound because think about it, energy should not be able to be defined with this absolute value. What matters should be the difference in energy. So what does the thermal dynamic energy mean? Yeah. What does it mean? And what these equations with those absolute form derived from is, is definitely correspond to some physical uh, law. Think about it, okay? So I have a few notes on uh, phase equilibrium, but I'm not going to go or talk about phase equilibrium yet because this, this semester we don't have enough time. To cover that. Next lecture on Thursday, I will start talking about uh, statistical mechanics. I will upload my note on phase equilibrium uh, to NTU Cool as uh, uh, optional reading material. Okay. In Dev Chandler's book, he spent quite a, a, quite some paragraph or quite uh, many pages on this equilibrium. This is important. So how Gibbs phase rule occurred and how, what's the first order phase transition, second order phase transition, so on and forth, so forth. We will, we will talk about that, but after we go over the IC model and the statistical mechanics for phase equilibrium, okay, we're not going to talk about this phase equilibrium uh, phenomena, phase transition, 
phenomena in, in terms of uh, conventional thermodynamics. We will use statement to discuss about it. Okay. Okay, I guess if there's no other questions, we'll uh, stop here. Okay, we'll stop here. Think about it. If you have any questions, we can talk about it or have a dis discussion next time. Okay. And I'll stop here for today's lecture. See you on Thursday morning then.